So there has been another interesting addition to the Utah Jazz roster so recently after Larry Markkinen ended up re-signing, getting his max deal of $238 million across five years. They ended up picking up, and forgive me if my pronunciation is slightly rough, I did practice a bit, but you never know, Svi Mikhailiuk of the former winners of the NBA championship in 2024, the Boston Celtics will be joining for guaranteed this upcoming season on $3.5 million and then going on further on down the line if he maintains it because those next three years are non-guaranteed for a potential maximum of $15 million across four years. Hello there. If you're new to the channel, it's your boy Wraith Hoops. Go ahead and smash that like button, subscribe, and turn on post notifications if you're into NBA basketball or you like the Utah Jazz, as I do this almost every day. With that being said, let's go ahead and explore a little bit of his background and what this means for the team. So he's 27 years old, he's 6'7", listed as being 205, got six years of NBA experience, and obviously it doesn't necessarily mean that he's the greatest player because he's on a not entirely guaranteed contract, but there is positives and negatives to that. The positive is that in my experience of watching his film as of late, he is a very solid three point shooter. The negative is that he just quite honestly hasn't really stuck to any particular team. He's not a great defender, which is probably part of the reason, but his overall three point consistency, though it ebbed and flowed in the very beginning of his NBA career, it has been very productive in the short minutes of play. So in my eyes, he's more so a very situational player than he is a, you know, 22, 26-ish minutes a night kind of guy. So does he push the needle for the Utah Jazz in the short term? Absolutely not. I'll go ahead and get that out of the way right now. So if that's what you came to the video for, there's your answer. However, however, I do like this. Obviously, it didn't cost us much, 3.5 million this year. You know, we had money to play around with after even when we ended up giving Larry Market in a little bit of extra money on top of this next year that he's gonna have. We really just needed to try some things out because this year we're gonna be tanking. It's no surprise, everybody understands it. We wanna get a top five pick in this upcoming year's draft. And at the same time, as we really want one really bad and we're going to be bad and rosters around the league are significantly better than ours, even teams like the Pistons have taken steps forward more than us this off season. I believe that ultimately we still need to be a little bit interesting and a little bit all over the place with how we try things this upcoming year. Because while we do have one of the less talented rosters in the league and one of the more raw rosters of the league, we still have players that have the ability to randomly probably give us a five or 10 game spurt of really good play. And you don't want them to just not play good, of course, but at the same time, you wanna make sure that even when they do play good, you can still not be a good team, if that makes sense. Basically, we can score 120 points, but we gotta make sure the other team scores 123 or 121, because we can't afford to win a lot of games. Otherwise, we're going to basically play ourselves out of the ability to have a really good draft like we're hoping to this upcoming year. And realistically, in my eyes at the very least, and it remains to be seen depending on how this year goes, I believe that this year will be the last year where we have to tank. And by tank, I mean like, this is the first year where we are consistently saying, guys, we're gonna be cheeks. We're, gonna, we're just gonna be terrible. And I think that the last year that was kind of the plan at the beginning of the season, then they started being a good team. Then we started playing with lineups. Will Hardy was doing his thing, working his magic, and we started winning. And it was like, oh, we're a pretty decent team. We could be a playing team. Like we really look like a playing team right now. And the trade deadline came around and we couldn't get anybody. We really wanted DeJounte Murray, couldn't get him. There's a couple other pieces that were at play and still couldn't get those guys. So they were like, you know what? Sell them off. And that's what they did. And so we ended up just folding the rest of the year and it actually worked in our benefit. I was very against trading guys like Simone Fontecchio because I was very high on his ability to be a three and D type player for us. He was just really consistent. But when you end up with the draft class of Isaiah Collier, Cody Williams and Kyle Filipowski, unless all three of them somehow become terrible by what we have expecting of them for the fact that we didn't have to move up in the draft or do anything special just to bag all three of those guys, even if one or two of them hit and not all three of them, 
that's still a really, really, really freaking good draft class. And so I feel really confident in what they have the ability to do going forward. As a result, I'm very confident that at the moment, at least, the front office is all on the same page about what this next year is supposed to bring and what the plans are going into the years following that. Larry Markin is on the same page. He is comfortable with the rebuild. He understands the way this year is going to go. The understanding from the outside of us looking in based on everything that the reports are saying and what all the officials in the media are saying, they know that they're not supposed to be good this year. Lowry understands that the team is supposed to be struggling. They're not going to have the pieces to be extremely competitive this year, but he's willing to wait this year out because he believes that there's going to be something shining at the end of the tunnel. And so we have to reward that by going ahead and taking it as seriously as possible. And honestly, in my opinion, I don't see a world where you need to tank this year. Remember, they have three first round draft picks this upcoming season. So if you tank this year, get three first round draft picks again, and double down on assets again, there's no reason that you need to tank the year after. You can be a middle of the road team. You can be a play-in team even. Because I, in my opinion, they will have the filling, the ability, the players, and the competency to do it. But there should not be another year after this upcoming 2024-2025 season where tanking is a guarantee for the Utah Jazz. Now, if there's a major injury and say Colin Sexton, you know, Lord forbid, has a severe injury and Larry Marketing also has a severe injury and whatever rookie we end up getting that's at the top of the class also has an injury, then yes, of course, you know, we're not going to be a very ascending power in the Western Conference as it is. But outside of that, I believe that we will take the steps forward. Now, how does this relate to Svi? Well, he's taking strides himself. Now, he has been able to make a living. As I said, he's been... In interesting waters, he's played for the Lakers, he's played for the Pistons, he's played for the Thunder, he's played for the Raptors, he's played for the Knicks, he played for Charlotte, he played for Boston, and now he's coming to the Jazz. That's seven teams in six years, brothers. So you could say, oh, he's a journeyman, oh, he's not going to really do anything. And in my eyes, there's some guys where you just kind of have them there when you plan on being a bad team. There's a lot of guys like that. There's some guys where they have a very limited scope of ability. And that's understandable too. I believe he's a plug and play kind of guy. From what I'm seeing overall, his shooting splits are really good from three point range. And that's what he's been best at across the entirety of his career. Now, career wise, he's averaged 3.5 three pointers per game and shot 36.3% on those. Now, that's an interesting number and it doesn't sound like he's a marksman it sounds like he's just slightly above average but when you take into account the fact that he's had quite a few seasons where he's played three games with the pistons at 6.7 minutes in those games he's had games where he's played 17 minutes where he's played three minutes where he's played 12 minutes where he's played 14 minutes it's kind of all over the place so that 3.5 attempts isn't necessarily the best scope of his ability and also we have to take into account realistically what the more recent seasons tell us about his particular play so with the last year he played with boston that was the year where he played with only boston there was no trade that ended up sending him all across the globe or anything like that with boston he played in half the games of the season he played in 41 he got two starts he only played in 10.1 minutes per game he had four points, 1.2 rebounds, 0.9 assists, 0.3 steals, and no blocks at all during the season. So going back to the defensive upside part, there's a little bit, but not very much. That said, he did end up shooting 3.3 field goals per game. He overall shot 41.6% from the field, which isn't great. But of those 3.3 shot attempts, 2.6 of them were from beyond the arc. He was one for 2.6, which is 38.9%. From the free throw line, he ended up going 0.1 for 0.2, which is 66.7%. Very negligible numbers from there. Overall, on his career, he shoots 76% on 0.8 free throws. So you understand he's not going to be driving downhill. He's not going to be attacking the basket. That's not his game. That's not his bag. That's not what he's known for. And we understand that, right? That's what the numbers indicate to us. And that's what the tape that I poured over told me about his game. However, from the three-point range, if we're going to go back and see what really his best arguably season from three-point range was, it was when he played for the one and only in 1920 for the Detroit Pistons, as a matter of fact, he ended up shooting a very surprising 40.4% from three on 5.1 attempts per game. Now in that season, he ended up playing in 56 total games. He started in 27, played 22.6 per game, had 
nine points, 1.9 rebounds, 1.9 assists, 0.7 steals, 0.1 blocks. Shot 41% from the field, nevertheless, in that one. So ironically enough, again, it tells us that most of his shots came from beyond the arc, which gives us more insight as to who he is as a player. And honestly, that's the best season where he's had the biggest opportunity to be the best version of himself because the next year he played for Detroit and he was okay across 17 and a half minutes, played in 36 games, started in five of them, but then got traded to OKC and he played 30 games for them, started in nine of them, played 23 minutes, averaged 10.3 points, three rebounds, 1.8 assists, 0.8 steals, 0.2 blocks. He ended up shooting 43.8% from the field and also shot 33.6% from three on 4.8 attempts. So it's like, okay, well, where did the three point shooting go? And going on further on down the list, you had years of 33, 33, 30, 60% on a very small 13 game sample size in 2022, 2023, where he only shot 0.83s per game. So that's really just not super impressive to talk about. He did, however, in 2022, 2023, play for Charlotte for 19 games. Again, he was traded from the New York Knicks that year at the very beginning of the year. And he started in eight of those games. He played 22 and a half minutes. He had 10.6 points, 2.4 rebounds, 2.7 assists, 0.7 steals, 0.2 blocks. He shot 44.1% from the field, 40.4% from three-point range on 4.7 attempts. Mind you, overall, he ended up shooting 8.5 field goal attempts. So again, over half of his field goals came from three-point range. But this was a little bit of a resurgence year where we can trust that his shot was a lot more reliable. Going into that next year again like i said with the boston celtics he had more of a role where he was coming off the bench he was just the marksman he shot 38.9 percent from three-point range on 2.6 attempts so looking at it from that point of view i think it's very clear just pouring over the entirety of his career that he's pretty one-dimensional and there's nothing wrong with that because the league has star players and alphas and then they have the sidekick characters the the robins to the batmans if you will and those robins have to be really good utility pieces that are good at individual specialized things because yes if you're good at doing a lot of things but you're not better than the main player who's going to have the opportunity to again do all of those things you're going to get left by the wayside because you're not essential you're just quite honestly not as good as them at everything but if you have a niche area that you really 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 excel in then by default they're going to use you and other teams will marketably want to have you for that specific aspect of your game and they will not expect you to do anything else we're not going to expect Sfi to come down the lane on transition and just boom on somebody that's not in his bag that's not his game but a corner three i definitely expect that from the top of the key definitely expect that from the wing definitely expect that driving kicks definitely expect to have him in there it's one of those things where it's not a big needle pushing move if you're hoping that it was going to be, which is, you know, I'm sorry for you. But to look at it from the Utah Jazz perspective, they are going to have him playing quite a few minutes. He's supposed to be splitting time between both wing positions, which is going to be very interesting, in my opinion. I'm not necessarily mad at it, but I feel like we have a lot of rookies where I really just need to see what and how these guys are going to fit in what they have to offer, what kind of steps forward we can see from guys like your Taylor Hendricks of the world, what Cody Williams going to be able to do even without having a great deal of size to his frame. Just a lot of little cogs in the machine that I want to see play. So speed, the fact that he is very one dimensional helps things out because I know I don't have to worry about him taking too much minutes from other guys. But I think this year being the only guaranteed year of his contract will allow him to prove whether he can be a long term piece that kind of sits around that eight to 10th man on the roster kind of spot where he only plays in situationally. And then especially once the team becomes a playoff team, remember he's only 27. So he's in Lowry's timeline when they become a playoff team and his shooting is essential. Can he be relied upon to do what is necessary and hit those timely shots? If he plays well this season, I believe that they will bring him back next year and they will give him that opportunity. But if he fails or shoots, you know, that lowly 32 33 percent from three-point range next year then you can best believe that he will not be here the year after because as we know we've had the kenneth lofton juniors of the world we've had the darius Baisley's, we've even had a couple other players we've had omer yurt seven and all these guys were decent pieces but not anything over the top not anything crazy and they couldn't stay they all got released so if he's going to expect himself to be on this roster after the 2024 2025 season He's going to have to do what he does really well at a very high level 
And then maybe we're having a different conversation next off season about how sneaky good this deal actually was. But until that happens, we'll be keeping an eye on him. As always, it's your boy Ray Thoops. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Have you seen him play before? Have you seen him live? Have you seen him on TV? Are you fond of his play style? Do you think that he could end up being on the roster after this year? Or do you think it's just to eat up a little bit of cap space and have somebody else there to fill out the roster at 14 players? With that being said, thanks for tuning in this video. Go ahead and smash the like button, subscribe, turn on post notifications, drop a dono, or become a member of the channel to help support the content. And as always, Good morning, good evening, and good night. No matter where you're on the globe watching, thanks for tuning in, and I'll catch you guys in the next one. Peace.